What's good? What's good, family? Listen, I just finished preaching a message that is critical for your spiritual well-being. Listen, today we just started a new series entitled All the Way In. And what it is, is a call away from middle of the road Christianity. I need you to know it's not good if you're part of the way in, most of the way in. It doesn't get good till you go all the way in. So today from Acts chapter 19, I preached a sermon on the seven sons of Sceva who experienced a defeat at the hands of the enemy, but it's instructive for us. The title of the message is, I don't know you like that. I need you to know God wants to know you. He wants to draw you into relationship. So do me a favor. Don't watch this by yourself. Gather somebody around the screen, get somebody around the television so we can get ready to go into the word. Title of the message, I don't know you like that. And if God has been good, go ahead and let's put our hands together for Jesus. He is a good God. Amen. Amen. So let's, let's jump on into it. First Timothy chapter 1, and we're going to begin together at verse 15, just one verse. And then we're going to go back to Acts chapter 19 as we launch into our series entitled All the Way In. First Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15. When you get there, let me hear you say amen. <clears throat> First Timothy 1 and verse 15. And I just want you to notice how the Apostle Paul refers to himself. He says, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to say what? Sinners of whom I am chief. Now go with me, if you don't mind, to Acts, the 19th chapter, where you're going to see a very interesting story that has real implications for us. Acts chapter 19 and verse 11, when you get there, say, Pastor, I'm here. Acts chapter 19 and verse 11. I'm going to ask those in the hallway if you want to come on in. Come on in now uh, so that once we get into the scriptures, once we get into the teaching, everyone is settled. Acts 19 and verse 11. The Bible says, Now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul so that even the handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick. And diseases left them, and evil spirits went out of them. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, We exorcise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. And also there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, who did, also, who did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. And this became known both to all the Jews and the Greeks dwelling at Ephesus, and fear fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many who believed came confessing and telling their deeds, and also many who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of them all. And they counted up the value of them, and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. But again, I'm going to read for emphasis verse 15. And the Spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Today, saints, I want to talk for a little while under the subject, I don't know you like that. I don't know you like that. Let's pray. Father, in this little while, would you please say much? Father, would you apply strong and heavy anointing to the preaching of the word? But Lord, would you grant an even greater anointing to the reception and the hearing of the word? And Father, I'm praying today that we would no longer outsource our spiritual authority to a few. But, Lord, may each and every believer lay claim to the divine prerogatives made available to us. Lord, move us away from pretend faith. 
to authentic faith. So, Lord, would you hide me in the shadows of the cross that Jesus alone might be seen, that Christ alone would be heard, and at the end of our time together, may Jesus alone be praised. We ask this in the name of him who is altogether lovely. It is in the name of Jesus that we pray. Let those who believe say together, amen and amen. You may be seated in the house of the Lord. Again, talking under the subject today, I don't, I don't know you like that. You know, friends, several years back, I attended a community event with a number of friends. And while we were there eating, it was noticed that one of my friends had a vegetarian plate that did not have any flesh products on it. And so somebody noticed that he ate a little bit differently, and they asked him, sir, are you a vegetarian? After a moment of brief contemplation, he responded, well, I'm mostly vegetarian. Cynically, the man responded, how can somebody be mostly vegetarian? Because in his mind, if you eat meat, the answer is no, I'm not vegetarian. And it's funny, he was a little bit offended. He said, well, I only eat meat two or three times a week, so I'm mostly vegetarian. And and, and, and so, again, the person responded cynically, if you eat meat a couple times a day, week, then you're not vegetarian. The answer is no. And it was interesting because he wanted to be credited with the lifestyle of being vegetarian without being fully committed to the process. And what became clear, friends, is that there are certain things that you can't do in part or in sections. The same way you can't be mostly vegetarian, you can't be mostly married, you can't be somewhat pregnant, I can't be black most of the time, you can't be sort of in school, you can't be partially on a diet, and most importantly, you can't be mostly Christian, kind of anointed, and somewhat Adventist. Y'all mighty quiet today. And the truth is that the journey of faith doesn't work in compartments. It only works if you're all the way in. And the reason sometimes that being a believer feels so hard is because we're only committed in sections. And the interesting thing is that we want to be uh, acknowledged as full believers, but we only want to commit certain segments to Jesus Christ. But the truth is that Christianity is neither fun or fruitful in segments. There, it's hollow if your anointing is only in association and there is no power in membership. In fact, friends, the outward symbol of believer's life is baptism so that you are not sprinkled on the body in portions. We don't just pour water on the head or in the hands. You literally have to go all the way down in the water, which is a symbol of death to the old life and a new life in Jesus Christ. And see, today's message shows us the danger of having Christianity through a association. And see, God, friends, is calling us away from incrementalism in the faith. He is calling us away from being weekend religionists. I need you to know that you can't experience the joy of Christ if you're just part of the way in. You can't get anointing if you're just half of the way in. You can't know freedom as long as you're most of the way in. Can I get seven folk to shout if you're all the way in with Jesus Christ today. And so go with me, if you don't mind, back to verse 11 of Acts chapter 19. I promise not to take too long today. Acts chapter 19 and verse 11. When you get there, let me hear you say amen. The Bible says, now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of who? 
The Bible says that unusual miracles were worked by the hands of Paul. Now, again, friends, in our text today, we find some essential truths for the church in our time. And in this text, you will see a sharp contrast between Paul, who is all the way in, and the sons of Sceva, who simply want faith through association. And the first thing the text teaches us is that your best ability is availability. Let me say it again. I need the church to know that your greatest ability is actually availability. Now, what should be noted, friends, is that the Bible says that God did unusual miracles through the hands of Paul. Now, I need you to get, church, that Paul's hands did not create the miracle, that Paul didn't just wish the miracle, that Paul didn't manifest the miracle. His hands were simply the conduit through which the power of God was able to flow. In other words, Paul didn't do it. It was simply God in Paul just working to do according to his will and great pleasure. In other words, I need you to get that Paul's hands are not powerful. Paul's hands are just available. Let me say it again. That, that Paul's hands are not powerful, his hands are just available. In other words, his hands are just like yours and mine. In other words, they're made of bone and muscle and sinew and ligament and skin. The purpose of his hands is to pick things up and set them back down. In other words, he doesn't have the biggest hands. He doesn't have the strongest hands. He might not have have the prettiest hands. He's just made his hands available to be used by God. And can I pause to say that the most fruitful person in this life is the one that makes their hands available to Jesus. See, let me say without apology or any equivocation that the person that's going to be most impactful and most satisfied is the one who says, Lord, I am available to you. And I need you to get the most fruitful person is not going to be the most talented person. It's not going to be the wealthiest person. It's not going to be the most intellectual person. It's going to be the most available person to Jesus Christ. Nice. And see, let me just say to somebody today that you might not have the best voice, but make that voice available to God and see what God will not bring to pass. You might not have the most gifts, but make them available to God and see how God multiplies it. You might not know the most to do Bible studies, but be available to God and watch what God will bring to pass. And what I need somebody to know is that in the realm of faith. It's not about your talent. It's not about your gifts. It's not about your degrees. The Bible says it's not by might nor by power, but it is by his spirit that change takes place. And see, I need somebody to know that as long as you become available, that you can be mightily used by God. Are y'all hearing me today? Listen, I remember a few years back, I had been driving around I, with my tags expired, but, but Malcolm, I had actually purchased my new tags, but they were just in the trunk of my car. And so as I'm leaving church one night, I noticed that there are police all around the church parking lot. And so I decide I better put these new tags on my car. And so I go in the trunk in search of a screwdriver, and there is no screwdriver there. My toolbox was at home. And so I look to the person to my left, and asked for a screwdriver. They didn't have one available. I asked for somebody in another car for a screwdriver, and they didn't have one available. And eventually, one of the deacons came and put a nickel in my hands. And I said, why are you giving me five cents? I need a screwdriver that costs about $20. And he says, Pastor, the nickel is in the same shape of a straight-edge screwdriver. And if you take that nickel and put it in the holster, you can turn it and unlatch the old one and put the new one. In other words, the nickel was not what I wanted. The nickel was not what I was looking for. Guess what? The nickel was just available. And what I'm 
saying is that somebody's gifts may not seem like they're more than five cents, but you give it over to God and little becomes much when you place it in the master's hands. Now, it's funny, friends of mine, the temptation uh, to look at this miracle, uh, the temptation is to look at this and be impressed by Paul. But how many of us understand that the strength of Paul's anointing is not an affirmation of his greatness, it's actually an indictment on how unavailable we are in our time. In other words, friends of mine, I need you to know that God will give good gifts to those that simply ask of him. Now, this is the thing I need somebody to get before you get too impressed with Paul and think this anointing is not available. See, how many of us understand that Paul's life doesn't merit this type of anointing? That his goodness does not commend him to God in this way. Remember, we just read in 1 Timothy chapter 1 that Paul says, of all sinners, I am the chief of sinners. And I need somebody to get friends that this is not self-deprecation. It is not just staged uh, humility. It is Paul saying that out of all the sinners God could have chosen, that God laid hands on me, the very worst of them all. You remember Paul in Romans 7 says, the good that I want to do, that's what I do not do. And the evil that I hate doing, that's what I continue to do. This is the same Paul that ordered the hit and stoning of one of the first deacons, Stephen, an apostle that was so wretched that even after he was named a disciple, that the Spirit had to send angels to tell the rest to receive him because they couldn't believe that God would lay hands on a sinner like this. And it's funny because some look at Acts 19 and see Paul's greatness. But when I look there, I don't see the greatness of any man. I see the grace of an almighty God who is so merciful unto us that he looks beyond all of our faults and he sees all of our needs. And is there anybody thankful today that God doesn't wait until we're whole to call us, but God is so merciful that he calls us while we're still under development. And see, friends of mine, this is where discernment is somewhat called for because sometimes the change of God in our lives can be so powerful that we're skeptical about people who say they're changed when we didn't see the change or we're not a part of the change. Okay. See, how many of us understand that most changes that God does, he does the change in public and private. He just uses the gift in public. So, so think back with me. When God calls the apostle Paul, notice that the scales are removed from his eyes in private. He is baptized in private. He receives the spirit in private. They don't know what's happening until God makes it known to everybody else. You remember when God called David. Samuel anointed him in private before he ever took the throne in public. Do you remember that Nicodemus came to Jesus at night, and his allyship with Christ didn't show up until he got near the cross. And what I'm saying to somebody today is that sometimes we get cynical about folk who say they've been changed because we weren't there to witness the change. But one of the things I've come to notice is that when you haven't been changed, you're skeptical of folk who say they are changed. But when you've been changed by God, you're not skeptical of somebody else's change because they did it for you. You can believe that God can do it for them. Are y'all hearing the pastor today? In other words, when somebody says, I've been delivered from drugs, you say, I can believe that because God delivered me too. 
There is somebody that when they say, I've been delivered from hate, you can say, I can believe it because God has delivered me too. All right, y'all acting brand new, so let me bring the Bible into it. When a sister says, I've been delivered from prostitution, Rahab would say, I can believe that because he delivered me too. When a brother says, I've been delivered from adultery, David would say, I can believe that because he delivered me too. When somebody says, I've been delivered from assault and murder, Moses would say, I believe that because he delivered me too. When someone says, I've been delivered from alcohol, Noah would stand up and say, I can believe that because I used to turn up in my tent too. When somebody says, I've been delivered from a demon, Mary Magdalene would say, I can believe that because he delivered me too. And do I have at least seven folk that don't need proof because you are proof. You are the proof that because God did it in you, you don't need convincing that God can change them too. And see, friends of mine, I'm just at a place when somebody says I'm changed, I would rather give a statement of belief as an investment instead of acting surprised so I can prove myself to be right. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? And what I want to say to somebody real quick is don't wait until you stop sinning to be used by God. I need you to know that it is when you get used by God that you get the power you need to overcome. Are y'all hearing me today? So this thing, church, it's blowing my mind. Your boy Paul is walking around with so much power, Bobby, that after he preaches, they take his sweat rag from the desk, run it down to the hospital, start laying it on the sick, and the sick get up and start dancing. Paul is so anointed that they take his work apron that he uses while building tents that is sweaty and grimy. And when he throws it down, they run it down to the rehab center, wrap it around broken legs, and the lame and the halt get up and start walking like, how you like me now? Paul is so filled that when he blows his nose... They take his napkin, run it down to the hospital, and put it on those with fevers. And guess what? The fevers start to leave them. In fact, the apostles were so filled that there would be times that the Bible says when they could not get to everyone, that they would take the lame and the halt and lay them in their path. And when they walked by them and their shadow fell upon them, the sick would get made well and the lame would be made whole. Are y'all hearing the pastor today? And see, what it's showing to us is that Paul was so anointed that he reached a place where he reached his spiritual saturation point. See, see, how many of us understand that you can get so saturated with the Spirit that like a garment that is filled with water, once it's completely filled, it reaches a saturation point so that once it can't contain anymore, it just begins to drip all over the pl- Are y'all hearing this today? In other words, you can get so saturated with the anointing that it cannot be contained, and guess what? You start dripping all over the place. Uh, See, the problem is we ain't got no drippy Christians in church no more. See, when you talk about your drip, you talk about your shoes and your bling and your car and your rims, but I need you to show me a different kind of drip today where you're so saturated with the Holy Ghost that because you're so full, that anointing starts spreading over everybody you come in touch with. 
And see, friends of mine, I need you to know that there are some in our time that are saturated with such wisdom that when you open up in your mouth and talk, you start answering questions that people have yet to ask, that God has saturated some of us with such financial abundance that you allow it to overflow and throw over into the mission of Jesus Christ. God has blessed some of us with such a cooking anointing. You ever met somebody that can't cook a small meal? They always cook more than enough so that somebody else has an abundance of food to be able to eat. There are some of us that God has put anointing in our hands so that you're able to use your gifts for the glory of God. There are some that God has blessed you with such musical gifts that you have more songs in your notepad than you have on your CD. I need you to know most weeks I have more sermon to preach than I have time to preach it because when God fills you. He doesn't just give you the minimum. He sends you in the overflow. So, so that some of us ought to be nearing our saturation point in the Spirit. Are y'all hearing me today, friends? And it's crazy because he was so full that it couldn't all be contained in his finite person. So when he can't contain it, it got in his clothes. It got in his garments. It dripped all over the place. And that's how God wants to bless us. And it's crazy, church, because I'm sitting there looking at this thing, Mark, because I'm wondering, I'm like, man, God, how do you give Paul so much? Why do you pour so much anointing into one man? On the day of Pentecost, the Bible says that cloven tongues of fire fell upon everybody evenly. But man, this seems like Paul gets an inordinate amount more than everybody else. And God showed me this, Kim, that sometimes God gives a whole lot to a few because the majority are unavailable. Okay. In other words, you realize Ellen White says that those that get up early in the morning get a double portion of blessing from God. And the reason they get a double portion is they get the portion that was laid out for those who sleep to 1215 in the afternoon. In other words, keep on sleeping late. I'm going to get yours, and I'm going to get yours, and I'm going to grab yours. I'm going to get the extra that God doesn't want to go stale. See, God has said, I can't let this anointing get stale. I can't let it go bad in heaven. I can't get it, let it rust because my people are not available. So whoever opens up their hands and makes themselves available unto me, I'm going to give them double, yea, triple, quadruple so that my work does not suffer. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying today, friends? And what I'm saying to somebody today is I need you to understand this fundamental truth. The reason, uh, that, that, that the reason that we don't see miracles that we used to is not because there is a famine of anointing. All right, since y'all mad, let me step all the way into it. The issue is that there is a famine of availability. See, see, I need us to understand that there are three types of vessels in the church in our time. You got empty and available vessels who are ready to be filled by God. But then there are some of us that can't be filled because we're already full of something else. In other words, because we're already filled with worldly ambitions and filled with our own desires and we're so full of our own pursuits and we're so full of trying to build an empire that we ain't got no time to grow his kingdom. I know y'all mad today. And see, the reason some of us can't be filled, some of us can't be filled because we're already full, and some of us can't be filled because we already got a lid on us. In other words, literally what's going to happen is there is a sin that will take place in the hallway where you will pass by opportunities to serve, opportunities to get involved, opportunities to get engaged. And every time you walk by, because I'm so busy and my job is so important and I'm so out there on social media, you are announcing to Christ, I've got a lid that is keeping me from being completely filled and used by him. And it's crazy because we pray a crazy prayer, but we're not willing to do our parts. We say, Lord, fill me, instead of saying, Lord, use me. How many of us know if you say, Lord, use me,
then he's got to fill you. But why are you praying for spiritual power if you're not going to be in a spiritual work? You see, the only folk that want spiritual power that don't use it for God are demons, witches, and warlocks. God calls apostles not witches, disciples not genies, and God is looking for people that will stop being spectator believers and start going forward in Jesus' name. And see, the problem is, we're still looking at this text and saying, man, pastor, I just don't believe that God can use me the same way he used Paul. See, I need you to know that God illustrates this in your life every day. He shows you how available the Spirit is. Because remember, Jesus says, man, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Father give the Holy Spirit to them that simply ask for him? So that you realize that, that when you turn on the faucet in your shower or in your sink, how many of us notice that you don't have to wait a long time for the water to come? Because I need you to know that the faucet doesn't call for water. The faucet just releases water. In other words, it's already there. It's already available. And when you turn it, all you do is release what has been standing there, pressurized and built up, waiting on somebody to call it. And I need you to know that when you ask for the Holy Spirit, he ain't got to send the Holy Spirit. He's just going to release what's been there on the precipice, waiting for you to let him come in and have full access to your life. Are y'all hearing me today, friends? And so the word says here in Acts chapter 19 and verse 13, the word says then some of the itinerant Jewish exercise took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, we exercise you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. The second thing this teaches us, friends, is the danger of having form without substance. So the Bible says that these men were Jewish itinerant exorcists. In other words, what they did was they went around casting out or claiming to cast out demons, and this is how they made their living. Now, I need you to get, man, what's going down here in Ephesus. See, Ephesus is a place of high traffic and high visitation, but Ephesus has sensual streams or vibes flowing through the city. In other words, I need you to get what drives the culture is witchcraft and magic and participation in the occult. The primary deity of the the area is the uh, lady uh, uh, deitist Diana who literally drives the visitation and the commerce of the town. In other words, what's happening in Ephesus is that the powers of darkness rule the day. They are absolutely killing the game. But now you've got these seven sons of Sceva that have carved out a little bit of a niche by claiming to cast out demons through the power of God. But the problem is Paul and the apostles are now moving with such authentic force that they are stealing the thunder of the seven sons of Sceva and now they try to piggyback on what Paul is doing. Now, I need you to know who these brothers are. The Bible says that these seven men are the sons of a Jewish high priest. In other words, they are not bad men. They are simply children that grew up in church. In other words, they are kids that grew up living at the temple, but they never got to know the God of the temple. In other words, they grew up knowing the temple policy. They knew temple protocol. They knew temple liturgy. They knew the temple's dimensions. They knew everything about the temple except the God who was beyond the last veil. In other words, friends, I need you to get that they are such a group that may have grown up so much around church and religious things. There is such a familiarity bus buster that they literally have contempt for the things of God. And it's demonstrated by the fact that they literally try to copy whatever the religious trend is of the time. And like many in our time, 
We're familiar with the things of God, but we don't know God for ourselves. And it's interesting because God works through personalities and human idiosyncrasies, Bobby. So it's crazy. So they they watching Paul and they studying everything he does. And so because, man, Paul preaches with a certain inflection in his voice, man, they try to mimic it and talk with the same inflection in their voice. Because Paul may speak with his hands, man, they try to impersonate that. And before they know it, they talking with their hands. Because, man, Paul has a certain lean when he walks. They get right behind it, man, and they try to walk just like Paul did. And then Jesus pronounced it because Paul has a certain accent. They actually mimic his accent. And see, the issue is they try to imitate Paul's form, but they never make contact with the substance of his power. And what they learn the hard way is that there are some demons that don't respond to your religious form. You're going to only be able to deal with them if you've got your own substance in Jesus. It's crazy because I get it. I remember as a young pastor, you know, when you're still trying to figure your way out, man, what happens is you kind of mimic those that you look up to. So it's crazy because I remember as a little boy, Malcolm's dad, Malcolm Sr. was our pastor, man, because he clapped when he preached. Man, sometimes I stole some of that and I clapped when I preached. And and I remember Walter Pearson, he would use language and tell stories. And so now I stole a little bit of that and I got some of that inside of me too. And then I would watch Elder Cleveland hold the pills and he would hold the appeal for like 30 minutes, and that's why I keep y'all here until the last person says yes to Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, I remember as a student, Elder Nixon would say at the end of the sermon, who believes the Word of God? And guess what? I stole a little bit, and I do a little bit of that too, but I need you to know I learned the hard way that you can have the public form, but until you get somewhere in a secret place and begin meeting with God for yourself, because the anointing is not in the display, it's not in the inflection. It's not in how you present. You only get that from a secret place. From God are y'all hearing me today? And see, I need us to understand that the public demonstration only flows out of private consecration. And see, I need us to understand that we essentially do the same things as the sons of Sceva because what we try to do is call on somebody else's Jesus. So that there are some of us that are children of the temple. And what we do, man, is we know how to say hallelujah just right. In church, we know how to wave our hands as if we are in the spirit. We know all the words to the praise team songs. We know how to clasp our hands and close our eyes like we're under anointing. And we even pray in the same vernacular that we had our parents pray in. But how many of us know that the authority is not in the form of religious expression. You've got to go somewhere where you're unseen and have a meeting with Jesus and get filled with the Holy Spirit because one day you're going to come upon a devil that's going to reveal that you might have the form, but you ain't got no substance behind it. See, it doesn't matter how much mama knew God. Doesn't matter how much granddaddy knew God. If you don't know him for yourself, you opening yourself up to the enemy. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying today? And see, I want to just say to those who are the sons and daughters of the temple, you grew up in it. You were born into it. But I need you to know it's not enough to be born into it. You got to be born again. You got to be saved. You got to be sanctified. You got to be filled with the Holy. Are y'all hearing the pastor today? It's crazy. It's not enough to have the form. You got to know Jesus for yourself. Remember, Dad, I remember growing up, we would go to the gym in our, our local city where we played uh, basketball on Saturday nights. And it's crazy. There was this one guy. He was dark-skinned. He was bald head. He kind of was kind of muscular. He looked just like Michael Jordan. And the crazy thing is when he came to the gym, he came in in a Chicago Bills jersey, had on a Michael Jordan jersey, had on Jordan shorts, had on Jordan socks, had on Jordan shoes, had a Jordan bag. But the crazy thing is, he had Jordan form, but he had Will Purdue game. Y'all not hearing me today. In other words, what he did was he had the public form of Jordan, 
but he was nowhere in a gym with no one looking and developing his game because the game takes time. The game takes sacrifice. The game takes commitment. But the easiest thing to do is to look like Mike. And see, the problem is we got too many believers that look like Mike. But we got Smush Parker character. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying today? And what I'm saying is you can't just have the form of Jesus. Matter of fact, this is what Paul says. He says in the last days, you're going to have a lot of folks that have the form of godliness. But they're going to be denying the power thereof. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying today? And see, friends, what I'm calling you today to is private consecration where we meet with God with no one else is around. I'm saying you got to get into the habit of opening up your Bible and digesting large chapters of the Word. Are y'all with the pastor today? Where you got to pray when no one else is around. Where you seek God and you learn how to have stillness. See, the problem with some of us, the reason prayer time feels so long in church is because you ain't got no prayer life outside of the benediction. The reason praise and worship feels so long is because you don't make no melody from your heart when it's just you and Jehovah. See, see, the problem with some of us is that my scripture reading is the most Bible you read all week long. And what I'm saying to the contemporary church is that we got to get back to the old way marks of prayer and faith where you know what you believe. You know why you believe it. You don't just believe every opinion on Facebook, but you study to show thyself approved unto God because you know the word for yourself. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? And it's crazy. I need you to know that when you have private time with God, church will be that much better when you come. See, I need you to understand the reason you feel, leave church feeling empty is because you ain't ate all week long. But if you go seven days without eating, no matter what you eat in that next meal, you're going to still leave hungry. Oh, y'all not hearing me today. And see, and this is why, friends of mine, I like these old school saints. Well, guess what, man? They don't have to call in as who's preaching. They don't have to call in as who's singing. Why? Because they're going to have some time with Jesus before they leave. And guess what? Church is going to be good no matter what happens on the platform. Because for some of us, worship started at 11. But for the rest, worship started around 6 a.m. We already been meeting with Jesus. For some of us, worship is an appetizer. But for the rest, worship should be dessert. Mm. In other words, church shouldn't be your starter. Church ought to be the icing on top of the cake. Oh, y'all not hearing me. In other words, some of us were going to be blessed one way or the other because you didn't wait till you got to church to praise, but you woke up and said, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Somebody woke up and said like David, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Somebody said, I'm not going to praise the Lord. I'm coming with praise for the Lord. I'm going to enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Somebody testify that from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, that the name of the Lord is to be praised. Is there anybody grateful today for his mercy and grace? You don't need a praise team. You don't need a choir. You don't need a preacher. I ain't got to force you to shout hallelujah. I need those old school saints who just say when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for me, my soul cries hallelujah. Thank God for saving a wretch like me. Uh. <laughs> see, see, sometimes church, sometimes before I come to church, sometimes you got to do what I call pre-eating. Now, I shouldn't say this too loud, but every now and then when I'm going to a potluck or a dinner, And I'm not sure if it's going to be good or, Kevin, if I know it ain't good. I don't go on an empty stomach. I'm going to get a little snack in my office, and I'm going to pre-eat. Y'all not hear me. So that even if it ain't no good, 
guess what? I'm still straight because I ate something before I got there. And how many of us know that sometimes before you come to church, you better pre-eat something before you come. So just in case the pastor ain't hitting it that day and the song ain't right, guess what? You still leave with a praise on your lips because you ate something before you came. Are y'all hearing me today, friends? Third thing this teaches us, watch this. Ooh, this is good. It shows that the anointed receive favor from God and the anointed get deference from Satan. All right, y'all, y'all. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Do you realize this shows us that the anointed get favor from God, but they also get deference from the devil. Are y'all hearing this today? The anointed get favor from God. And the anointed are even shown deference by the enemy. Now, you got this thing is a wonder to, I, man, I wish they had caught this on Facebook Live. Where, like, man, these boys are out there, man. I mean, they, they I mean, listen, they, they didn't, they didn't call out, man, a lot of folk that had demons, but this day, they came up on the wrong one. And before I show this, you know what this shows us, friends of mine, is that you ought to be careful and have some reverence about how you treat the work of God. Can I say it like the old school preachers would say it? Be careful before you jump in a pulpit, on a deacon's bench, at a door, or behind a mic, or in a choir loft. Because when you do that, you enter into a whole new realm of spiritual warfare. You ain't got to be perfect, but you can't be pretending. Are y'all hearing the pastor today? So you got to see this joint. I mean, the joint is kind of absurd and comical. So, man, they're watching Paul's, the way he walked. Man, they're watching the way he uses his hands. They're watching the way that he talks. They're watching his voice inflection. Man, it's crazy because this demon just walks by. He's just minding his own business. This devil ain't messing with nobody. Man, and I've learned that if a devil ain't messing with nobody, you might not need to mess with him. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? I mean, he's just living his best life, going in his own business. But now and then, guess what? They're standing like Paul, and they're communicating like Paul. They got Paul's inflection. But, man, they literally say, man, we cast you out in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches about. They don't call on their own Jesus. They try to get anointing through association. And it's crazy because this devil stops in his tracks, turns around and looks at them. Maybe his eyes were green or blue, but now they show up fire red to show another occupant has taken control. And perhaps he does not speak in a man's voice, but multiple voices come from outside of him. And notice what the devil says. He says, Paul, I know. Jesus, I know. But yo, homie, I don't know you like that. And I don't know exactly how he does it. Maybe he's 18 or 20 feet away. And before we know it, he leaps upon them in one bound. And the Bible says the one man with supernatural strength overwhelms seven men. And the Bible says he beats them bloody, bloody, sends them out naked. And as they're running home, the devil says, now run tail that. Now, I'm not sure if y'all got what he just did. Before he came for them, he showed a certain amount of deference to the anointed. He says, I'm going to do to you what I would never do to Jesus. I'm going to come for you in a way I would never come for Paul. Y'all not hearing this. He's saying, man, I'm going to come at you in a way I wouldn't come at the anointed. Why? Because he's saying, when I see the anointed, I see a covering. I see a hedge. I see a power that I can't fool with. 
that the anointed got something that I can't breach. They got a protection system that I can't penetrate. So there are certain attacks that I send on the anoint, unanointed, but he I says, I ain't even touching the Lord's anointed that way. Now, again, I don't want to call us too presumptuous. I'm not saying the devil won't attack, but what he knows is that I just can't come with outside force. He says, that anointing on you is so strong. I can't just come and run roughshod all over you. He says, I'm going to attack, but I ain't going to, man, run my head up against a brick wall. I know how that's going to end for me. So he says, the only way I can attack you is to get you from, to come from behind that hedge and enter over into the devil's terrain. Ooh, somebody should shout. He cannot just come, oh God, and just jump on your kids. He can't just come overtake your marriage. He can't just come overtake your health. He can't just overflick you with disease. Anybody thankful that you got a hedge around you? And the only way in certain forms you The only way that he can stop you is if you leave from behind the hedge that God has put all around your life. Are y'all hearing me today? See, some of us still hadn't got it. You still looking at the story scared because you see yourself as the seven sons instead of recognizing your Paul. You got a hedge around you so great that the devil says, I can't even waste my time like that because I know I can't defeat God's head. All right? I'm going to preach this story later on down the line. But do you remember the day in Job chapter 1 where the sons of God came to present themselves to God? And guess what? The Bible says that Satan came also. And so God says to Satan, from whence do you come? He says, from walking back and forth in the earth and from walking up and down on it. And notice what God says. He says, have you considered my servant Job? Notice what the devil says. He doesn't have to look up Job. He doesn't have to look him up on Instagram. He says, yes, I know who Job is. You've got a hedge around this family. You've got a hedge around this house. You've got a hedge around this possessions. You've got a hedge around everything he has on every side. Now, the question is, how does he know that God had a hedge around Job? It stands to reason that he had already tried, but he couldn't penetrate the hedge that God put around his servant. Are y'all hearing me today, friends? And what I'm saying to somebody today is that God has got a hedge around you. He's got an anointing so strong that the devil cannot penetrate it. He cannot overwhelm it. The only thing he can do is to entice you to come from behind it. Now, I'm hoping that the church of the living God is getting the point. This is the point. We walk around here on edge, nervous about the devil's attack. But did y'all did y'all see what just what the devil said itself? He confessed unexpectedly. He says, man, sometimes the anointed walk around scared of me. But man, I'm I'm actually scared of them. And what this message is about, friends, it is about us reclaiming the spiritual authority that God has said is ours in the Scriptures. No longer should the body of Christ walk around afraid of the devil, exalting in his power, talking about how the devil got his foot all over my neck. I need to know, do I have at least 12 blood-washed, Holy Ghost-filled, saturated saints of the Most High God that can say, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I need somebody to lay claim to Acts 1 and verse 8 
that ye shall receive power when the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses of me in Jerusalem and Judea and to the uttermost ends of the earth. I'm looking for some saints that know that we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. I'm looking for some saints that know that the kingdom suffereth violence, but the violent take it by force. I'm looking for some saints that know that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. I'm looking for some saints that know that when you pray, the devil trembles and he flees. Is there anybody that still knows that there is power in the name of Jesus? Ah, I need some Pentecostal Adventists in this place today that know when you pray in Jesus' name, sickness has to flee, leprosy has to submit, demons have to come out. I need some folk that know that when you pray in his name, provision is made available, churches get revived, kids come back to church, is there anybody that knows that when you pray in his name, sins get overcome, strongholds get broken, addictions get uh, fast out. I need somebody to know that when you pray in his name, you can cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. Why are we walking around sad? Why are we walking around scared? Why are we walking around pitiful? Go in his name. Act in his name. Call on his name. Pray in his name. Believe in his name. Hope in his name. Anticipate in his name. And receive in the name of Jesus. Somebody say, Jesus. Jesus. Jesus, there is power when we call on that name. You are not the sons of Sceva. You got the same anointing that Paul has. He's just anointed you to do a different work than Paul did. There are diversities of gifts, but it's the same spirits. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? And I'm looking for an all the way in kind of church to rock with me for these next 21 days where it's not just always about the corporate gathering, but man, we're going to set aside time for private consecration. And I need you to know God works unusual miracles through his hands. Saints, his hands are just like yours. You ain't got to have gifted hands like Ben Carson. You just got to have anointed hands. You ain't got to have the best voice. You just got to have an available voice. And God is saying, and this crazy thing, do you realize how much energy it takes to pretend to be a Christian? It, it actually takes more energy to perfect form than to actually receive the fullness of the Holy Ghost. You spend your years, you spent your whole life perfecting the form, not realizing that as soon as I said yes to God and I'm completely available, guess what? Full anointing is released when you just turn the nozzle and say yes unto him. And it's crazy the way the story ends because it shows us something very critical, that sometimes salvation comes when we learn from what the devil did to other people. So, so you realize if Satan wanted to win that day, you know what he should have did? He should have just kept it moving. But the thing about the devil is he's a thief. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy, and he can't help himself. So do you realize what happens when he leaps on the man who preaches in the name of the Jesus whom Paul preaches? What he simply does is he authenticates the actual power that was in Paul in Jesus. 
He said it by accident. I know Jesus. I know Paul. I just don't know some of y'all like that. And it's crazy because, man, when they see, man, the authority that's in the name of Jesus and the authority that is in what Paul preaches and what he declares, and he sees what happens, and the city sees what happens to those that didn't know Jesus. Know what happened? It was revival in the whole city. The Bible says that they came with their spell books and witch books and magic books, and the Bible says that they burned them because they saw what the devil did to them. And can I just pause real quick and say to somebody, sometimes, man, you ain't got to see the devil do it to you. Young people, sometimes you need to turn around when you just see with your eyes what the devil did to the people you love. See, you ought to turn around because you see what happens, what the devil did to them when they start smoking. Look at what the devil did to them when they start praying. Look at what the devil did to that house when it stopped being covered in worship. Look at what the devil did to them when they stopped coming to church. Look at what the devil did with them when they separated themselves from God. Guess what? It ain't got to happen to you. But man, they saw what happened to those guys. They were like, I don't want that to be my fate. Let me get connected with this Jesus. And guess what? We don't want to just preach in or, or know him in somebody else's name. We don't want to pray uh, uh, to the God whom Paul preached about. We want to pray to the God of our salvation. We want to know him intimately and personally and powerfully for ourselves because they came to know that there was power and authority and healing and transformation in the name of Jesus. And I need somebody to know that there's still power in that name and authority in that name. In the next 21 days, we're going to reclaim the power that God has made available to us when we go all the way in and lay full claim to the authority and the power that's in the name of Jesus. Somebody give him praise today.
Standing to our feet. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. There is nothing more exhausting, frustrating, and fruitless than pretend Christianity. That literally is formed based upon who's seeing it at the time. But God is calling us over these next few months to go deeper, to go more authentic, to experience every promise in scripture as your lived reality. And I need to say to some brother, sister, boy, girl, like you've been going part of the way, you're going most of the way. And then there are some of us, man, that just, we know Christ through association, what our parents did, what our grandparents did, but at some point, it's got to be yours. Because at some point, and some of us are there right now, some of us have come upon some devils right now that have no deference for religious form. But they're going to reveal. It's crazy because what, what the, the devil did is he beat them and he stripped them naked. And he simply put their physical posture to reflect their inner nakedness of soul. Have you ever dreaded the start of a new week? Has the start of a new week ever felt too big for you? I want to help you out with that. Breath of Life presents Fresh Start Sunday. It's a series of programs designed to help you face the new week with a reset, a kickstart, to just begin with a whole new energy. Every first and third Sunday, I invite you to join me in the scripture lab. When I'm in the lab, we're going to be testing, breaking down, and applying the Word of God. It's gonna be a space where we answer your questions, settle disputes, and help you come to conclusions about doctrine and larger social issues. Every second Sunday, I invite you to join Gianna and myself as we begin a series of conversations around dating and relationships entitled Points of View. We're gonna be sharing from our own experience and we're gonna be joined by an array of experts and panelists designed to help build us up and be strengthened in the areas of dating and marriage. And every fourth Sunday is what we're calling Vision Sunday. Pastor Nugent and I are gonna be reaching out to pastors, ministry leaders, entrepreneurs, CEOs, writers, inventors, to make sure that those visions don't get stuck in your head, but that they might be able to be implemented in your daily experience. Friends, we're done fearing the new week. We're done dreading what's to come. We're going to start the week with hope, beginning the day with encouragement and clarity, because the best way to have a great finish is to have a fresh start. Join us starting in the month of July, every Sunday at 10 a.m. I look forward to seeing you for a fresh start. What's good, family? One of the things that makes the faith journey hard is incrementalism. It's where we test God, where we try God, where we try to ease our way into it. But I need you to know 
that faith doesn't work in increments. The faith journey only works when you go all the way in. I wanna invite you to join me on August 26th as we begin a new teaching series entitled All The Way In. It's a call away from middle of the road Christianity, but to be fully committed and invested in Jesus Christ. We're gonna spend several weeks looking at Bible characters who went all the way in with Jesus. And then I wanna encourage you to join us on Sunday, August 27th, as we begin 21 days of prayer. We're gonna be utilizing my book, All The Way In. It's a 21 day guide to spiritual revolution. We're gonna meet each Monday through Friday at six o'clock a.m. online. And then we'll meet Saturday and Sundays, Saturdays at 8 a.m., Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. It's gonna be a powerful time of prayer, praise, testimony, and encouragement. The body of Christ is gonna be built up in every needed way. Listen, I need you to know, man, the spiritual journey doesn't work when you're part of the way in. It doesn't work if you're most of the way in. It only works when you go all the way in. If you want to get a copy of the book all the way in, if you're in Huntsville, go to the Oakwood University Church Market. If you're outside of the city of Huntsville, go to our website, go to our market store at www.breathoflife.tv. For the past 49 years, Breath of Life has been presenting the gospel of Jesus Christ from a contemporary urban perspective. In 2023, we plan to grow our reach and your donations are what help make that possible. This year, our major goal is to launch our Breath of Life weekly broadcast into five new cities. In addition, we're excited to introduce our new Breath of Life Kids platform with original content created with your little ones in mind. We'll continue with innovative programming, dynamic preaching, and sharing the gospel through evangelistic campaigns. 